Growth is a natural process of life. All things planted from a small seed grow and mature in God's glorious design and purpose. Luke chapter 2, verses 52. And Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and all people. We also are called to mature and grow in the things of God, so the fruit of our lives can be enjoyed and bring life to the world around us. So come on, let's grow where you're planted. This series is all about, it's about outward growth. Uh, we talked about at the beginning of the year, hey, listen, if 2023 is going to be a great year, we all want it to be a great year. We'd make a lot of changes in our lives so that we can have a great year. Um, and if we really, truly want it to be a great year in 2023, the, one of the things that we need to have is we need to have a great year spiritually in 2023 that we need to grow in our faith in Jesus, and we will experience, regardless of what, we, what goes on in our life, what happens all around us, that we will experience a great year because God is with us, God is for us, and he's, he's, he's with us, with, around us, and within us. And so we, over the past four and a half months, we've, or five months now, we have been really talking about what it looks like to grow spiritually. We've been engaged all internally of what this looks like to grow internally. It's a, and this series is really all about outward growth in our lives. And we're, because it's a beautiful time because we are in a season of growth. Now, when we don't have droughts. <laughs> but we're in a season of growth. We see, we see amazing things take place, right? We see the, we see the leaves on the trees, or they're, filling, they're filling up. Uh, we see the flowers blooming. We see the yards, uh, the, the men's happy space begin to grow, Right? And they get to tend to it and watch this beautiful thing take place. And we even, even in this time of, of season of growth, we even see things growing in spaces that we're not expecting. Like our landscaping, right? Like, uh, like in our yards, <laughs> right? In our gardens, in those places, we even see them in places that we really don't expect. You know, we see, well, we see things like this take place that doesn't make any sense. That, that makes no sense. That the environment that it is in, the things that are, are around this thing, we see things growing in the midst of this. Why is that? What is the purpose behind that? Well, that's because growth is God's desire for his creation. It's for his creation. That it would grow regardless of the environment, regardless of the circumstances, that growth would take place. And that includes you, that includes me. That growth would take place in our lives, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of our environment, that we would experience growth, regardless of our maturity in our life, that we would, we would grow in our lives. We would experience this internally and externally. And we see this, we see this as, uh, as you saw in the video um, in Luke 2.52, we see this being lived out in Jesus' life. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. 18 years of Jesus' life described in one verse. From the ages of 12 to 30, we see that he, we don't know anything else. But what we do know is that he grew. He grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. In this verse, this verse that's buried at the end of chapter 2, we see this four areas of Jesus' life being recorded, growing in stature, wisdom, and favor of God and man. In week one, we talked about what it looked like to grow in stature, what it, what it meant, what it truly meant for Jesus to grow. He grew in height and weight, like we all do, but more importantly, he grew in, he grew in maturity. He grew in understanding and last week, we, we, well, last week, you, you got a chance to hear about what it looked like to grow in wisdom, correct? Yes. Okay, good. And today is really focusing on one piece of that, of that verse, which is, is to grow in favor with man. That's our, that's our focus today. So let's, let's start with that, because that's a, that's a phrase that what, that, what does that even mean, to grow in favor with, with man? So let's start with understanding what favor is. Favor as defined is approval, support, liking. So if we add the, the piece of it where it says favor uh, with man, we would see that we would see favor, with favor with man would be approval with man. 
We'd see support with man. We'd see liking with man. And you hear that, you begin to hear that definition and some of you can go, okay, yeah, I know, I understand what that looks like. I understand what it looks like to have approval from man with man. I understand what it looks like to have support from mankind with mankind. I understand what it looks like to experience, to be liked with by mankind. I, I understand. I've experienced some favor in my life. And some would say that, I, some of you would actually say that, you know, I really don't know what that looks like. Some of you today would say, I, I feel like it's been an uphill battle my entire life. I've never really been liked. I, I've, it's, I've, I've never really been supported. I've never been really been approved. You feel like it's been nothing but obstacles in your life. Nothing but disapproval or lack of support or, or lack of liking. And if we stop and we really reflect upon this, and we look at why would this be the case in our life, some, some of the reasons why we would, we would be experiencing the lack of approval or liking or support from mankind has a lot to do with our own choices in our life. Some of the things that we have done, some of the choices that we've made, some bad choices that have caused well, mankind not to really approve of us, to support us, to, to like us and for that fact. Our behavior the way we have behaved has caused, us, caused this in our lives. We may be experiencing a lack of favor with man because of our own doing. In reality, what we're, what we're really truly experiencing is we're experiencing the consequences, the consequences of our choices and our behavior. And for some, maybe you have no good explanation for this. Maybe for you, it's, it just, you just don't understand. I'm kind, I'm friendly, I'm likable. I just don't understand why I'm not, a, I don't understand this. You feel like you've been a good person and honestly, maybe it feels like the reason you haven't found favor with man is because of things that you are completely out of your control. Maybe it's been the circumstances you, you were born into. Maybe it's because of Maybe it was because of the choices of those around you as you were growing up. Maybe it's because you look different. Maybe because you act different. Not like behavior-wise, but because of the culture that you were raised in. Culturally, you're, just, you're, you're, you're different. Your upbringing was just different. Maybe you feel like this has been the case because your interests are just different than the rest of the world. Maybe you prioritize life a little bit differently and it feels like it's been just, a, just an uphill battle completely because the rest of the world doesn't see it that way. And maybe you're feeling like this, these are things that are out of my control and honestly, you're, you may be, you're probably right. In many ways, you are probably right. So I want, before we really get into this, I just want to take a moment. If you feel yourself in that space where it feels like I have just not experienced the favor with man at all in my life, and I really feel like it has nothing to do with me, can I just stop and just say I'm sorry? I'm sorry that that's what you are experiencing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry that this has been the experience in your life. And maybe you're saying, well, Nate, no, you have nothing to be sorry for or sorry about. Well, I, I probably I have, may have not been directly connected to your experiences that you have had, but if your experiences have been beyond your control, someone should be apologizing to you. And I can't guarantee that someone will. At least someone who's connected to the experiences that you've had. So today I just want to offer a moment of healing for you and just say I'm sorry. That this has been your experience. Because today I'm here to say that you deserve better. You deserve better. You deserve better because God wants better for you. God desires better for your life. He desires that you would experience favor with man because the other side of that is not how he sees you. That's not what you have been created for. He sees you as beautiful, likable, worthy of his love, worthy of people's love, this, this has been God's desire for each and every one of you. You see, much of favor from man that we experience, ultimately, ultimately, 
is, is, is tied to our circumstances. It's, it's tied, tied to the situations that we find ourselves in. But I want you to know that there's a better way. There's a much better way for us to experience the favor of man in our lives. The favor with man. And it starts with this phrase that we've heard many times, but we've heard the flip-flop of it. I would say that it starts right here, that we would keep the horse before the cart. Because many times we have the cart before the horse. You've heard that phrase, right? It means it's going downhill. We've lost control of it. What we have put in, in the very front of our lives is what's pulled us. It's the one that's pulling us down the hill. But if we put the horse where the horse belongs, we will, it will take us to where we need to go to experience the things that we need to experience. Let me tie it up with scripture. In Matthew 6, it says this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That if we would keep Jesus at the forefront of our lives, we would keep the horse in front of the cart. We would experience what God promises for us. Now, favor for you may be thinking like everybody's just going to like me. That's not going to be the case. It's not going to be the case. But there's going to be things that take place that you can't explain. What I'm saying is this, is that the, the, the favor with God and with man, they're so closely tied within that verse because they go together. You can't get, you can't get the favor of man in front of the favor of God. You must, we must be seeking after the favor of God in our life, growing in favor of God in our life for us to truly experience the favor with man. That's, that's the only way it takes place because otherwise it's completely circumstantial. There is no such thing as genuine favor of man without God's favor in our life. Genuine, true favor of man comes from having the favor of God in our life. Let me say it again. It does not mean that everybody likes you. We have examples that we'll go through. You'll see this. Without the Lord at the very center of it, it is purely circumstantial. Here's what I mean. It means that I may have experienced the favor of man within my job, but I do one, th one thing wrong, there's no more job. Right? Relationships, I'm searching after. I just want to be, have, I just want to be liked. I just want to have the favor of man and mankind in my life. And, and, and I'm making all of these relationships, but I do something wrong and all the relationships flutter away, I've gotten the cart before the horse. It's all circumstantial. It's wisdom that we, that we need to search for, as Jason would have talked about last week. Wisdom can be found in Scripture. Wisdom is found in Scripture. Here's what, here's what wisdom is, though. There's knowledge that we find in Scripture, but wisdom, wisdom is knowledge fueled by experience. It's, it's fueled by, we have the knowledge and we have, now we have the experience, we now have wisdom. Now we don't have to experience it for ourselves, but we see, we see this within the pages of Scripture, in the book of, book of Proverbs, all kinds of wisdom. Solomon, King Solomon, when he searched after all the meaning of life, he experienced all sorts of different things, and he came back with all kinds of wisdom as to these are the things that you need to avoid. These are the things that you need to chase after. There's a whole other book in Ecclesiastes that really focuses on that, but I want to focus in on Proverbs chapter 16. So as I read through this, uh, let me just, well, just let me read through this. Proverbs chapter 16, beginning in verse 1, it says, it's the plans of the heart belongs to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. So let me stop there for just a moment because here's, here's the reality that we need, to, we need to grab a hold of. Here's the truth that we need to apply to our life is that the Lord, the Lord God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, they know our reasoning for things. In our own eyes, we may have pure intentions of why we're doing things, but he sees the heart. He weighs the spirit within us to know what our reasoning is for why, the why we would do things. He knows our why. He's the one that knows our why. And verse three goes on and says this, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. This is important. 
See, this piece is really important. When we talk about cart before the horse and horse in front of the cart, this is a heart, or the horse in front of the cart moment right here, that we would commit our work to the Lord, that we would commit ourselves, what we do to the Lord, and he, he will establish the plans. He will be the one that establishes our plans. He's the establisher. He's the one that we want in the front. He is the one that will pull us into the direction that we need to go into. He continues on into verse four and he says this, the Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. When a man's ways please the Lord, listen to this, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Take a moment and just take that in. What those four verses are really what we've, just been, what we've been talking about. That when we put God at the very front, we put Jesus at the center of our focus, when he becomes the horse before our cart, what we will experience, what we are set to experience, will it be all roses and rainbows? No. But he will make a way through it all. Because he is the establisher. He is the one who, who, who makes the way. These writings of wisdom point us to what we said earlier, that Jesus, what Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. All these other things will be taken care of. The things that are necessary, the things that are needed will be taken care of. Why? Because he's fair and he's just. We look at some of the circumstances of our life and we see the lack of favor of man with our life and we, we tend to go, God, why? Why was I born into this situation? Why was I treated this way? Why do I look this way? Why am I interested in these things? Why, 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 why? This isn't fair. But we don't understand fair and just as God does. We don't understand, we don't understand what fair and just is. The one who created us does. As Jesus does. We see in Proverbs 16, 11, it says this, a just balance in scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his work. This picture that he's showing us is, is the weights and scales of justice and fairness. That, that, that all the weight that's put in the bags when we entrust our lives to him, when we, we put him first in our lives, what we begin to experience is that he's the one that puts all the weight in those bags. What, it, what it's saying is, what, it, what I'm saying is that the full weight and work of true justice and fairness is in the hands of the Lord. The, the full weight, the full weight and the full work of true justice and fairness. We want, tr we, want, we want justice and fairness, right? We want to experience that. We want others to experience that, but most importantly, we want to experience that. We want to experience that. What it's, what it's saying is that all of that, everything that, that weighs in the balance, that is in the hands of the Lord's, and he will weigh it out. He will even it up. He will be the one that brings justice and fairness to our lives. It may not look like the way we want it to, but he will make it fair for us. So you may be wondering, well, how do I experience that? How do I experience that in my life? How do I experience the full weight and work of justice and fairness in my life with mankind? How can I experience that with others around me? What does that look like? Well, I think there's steps that we can take that we can begin to really understand and experience what this looks like. And the first place that we need to start is that we need to be honest. We need to be honest with ourselves. We need to be able to look in the mirror and to be honest with what we see. We need to look at our life. We need to judge it up against something. And we need to be honest with it, about it. This is really where I stand. And because of this is where I am, I need to know who's the one that's running it. Look at this in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. 
Paul, the letter of the Romans, he says this, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, to not think of himself more highly than he ought to, to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. That we would be able to stop and we would be able to really, really look. And that doesn't have to, we don't have to guess. We don't have to guess. The answers are there. The, answer, the answers are there. And if we're really honest, if we're really truly honest, we all know that we fall short. We all do. That no one stands above anyone else. That we all fall short of the glory of God. But because of Jesus, but because of God's great love for us, there's more for us to experience. That it doesn't have to stop there. The second thing that I think that we need to, that we can do, that the step that we can take and put, establish into our life is after we've been honest, we see ourselves the way that we should, we look in the mirror, we understand that we stay, where we stand when we look within the pages of scripture, we realize that we do fall short, that we do need someone to help us along. The next piece that we would do is that we would be humble. To experience, to experience favor with man, from man, it takes us being honest and being humble. And th- this being humble piece is probably something you've heard us say often. But I truly believe that it is incredibly important to our, our journey in life. Why? Because it's what we see within the pages of Scripture. It's what we see in the examples that have gone before us. It's, we see it in the accounts of individuals who experienced unlikely favor with man. We see it all in here. We see the life of Moses. Moses who, who, who ran, ran out of Egypt, ran out of, the, out of the Egyptian kingdom into hiding because of him killing a man, comes back. God sends him back. He sends him back and stands before the king. And it was, it, was it easy? Was it work out all the way through as he expected it to? No. But because he pursued after God with his whole heart and his whole soul and his whole being, he found favor with the Pharaoh and his people were released and he led them out of slavery. We see, this, we see this with Joseph. If you don't know the story of Joseph, Joseph, the youngest of, of many brothers, he found himself with the favor of God. He loved the Lord with all his, all his being, pursued after him with all that he had. He... he he found himself in places that he didn't belong, arrested. He found himself, he found himself in jail. He found himself, then he found himself in the courts of the, of the king as well. He found himself in an unlikely space that he should have been, but he found favor with mankind where he was actually a part of ruling. It didn't make sense. It didn't, it didn't make sense at all. Was he liked by all mankind? No, but he found an unlikely circumstance to turn in his favor with mankind because of his favor with God. We see that with Samuel. We see it with Nehemiah. We see it with Jesus. Wait a minute, Jesus was killed by mankind. You're right, but he also found favor, found doors opening that didn't make sense. Found himself in places that really he shouldn't have been because of because he had God right where he, he belonged and they were humble when they approached people it wasn't it wasn't filled with arrogance it was filled with humility they stepped before kings and and and, and leaders and they were humble and courteous and kind and they experienced they experienced favor with man. Here's the thing that we often get twisted. We feel like we, we see hu- humble in a different way than what it really is. What humble really equals out to is being trusted. We're honest and we're humble. We're not filled with arrogance or pride, but we find ourselves end up being trusted. Here's what hu- humility is not a lack of confidence, though. That's where we get tripped up. We think it's a lack of confidence. That's not what it is. What humility is, is being tuned into the reality of God's sovereignty of the world around us. That God is the one in charge of all of this. That he's the one that makes things move. 
that we, are, that we just submit to ourselves to him and he will do the things that need to be done. We just take the steps that he is offering for us. James, the brother of Jesus, he witnessed this. He saw this take place and he writes about this. In James chapter four, verse 10, it says this, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. He will lift you up in honor. What humility is, humility is understanding that God does the lifting up. That we don't have to hold him up. He's the one that's holding us. He's the one that lifts us up. He is the one that does the lifting. The cart before the horse would be seeking favor of man before God. Something that we need to understand is that the lack of favor with man, the lack of favor of man is a vessel in which God humbles the proud. Let me say that again. Let me say that again because I think it's important for us to hear this. Something that we need to understand is that the lack of favor with man that we experience is a vessel in which God humbles the proud. We can choose to humble ourselves or we can be humbled. And for us seeking after man's approval in our life, just to seek after man's approval in our life, we will be humbled. We will be humbled. Humility is the vessel in which God lifts his children up in the full sight of man. So what does that, what does that even look like? How, do we, how, do we be, how are we lifted up in the sight of man? This leads us to this third piece is that we would serve in love and joy with purpose. That we would serve not out of our obligation or a have to, but we would serve in love. Because I get to, because I've been served. And we would enjoy the fact that we get to do that. And it's not just, just to do it, but there's purpose behind it so that people may see who God is, so that people may see who Jesus is by the way that we love each other, that we would love one another. It's the idea that we get to do this. We get to do this. That the opportunities that we have to serve in love and joy with purpose, with, love, with one another, is something that we don't have to do because we don't, we get to. Listen to this, this uh, from the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians. He writes this, and it's the second chapter. It says this, do all things. <laughs> do all things without grumbling or disputing. <clears throat> Ouch, right? Right? Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Why? That you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. <sighs> that what we would get the opportunity to do because I, let's be honest, if we're really truly honest, we may not feel this way, but the reality is, is that all that we get to do in our life, we get to do. It's, it, has been a, it has been a gift that has been given to us. Whether it feels like it or not, God has placed breath in your lungs. He has sustained that breath. And today you are here with the opportunity to serve, to love one another. That that's what we get to do. And what Paul is saying is, listen, we need to shift the way that we see this. That because of what God, because, because of what Jesus did, because Jesus gave up his life, he gave up the breath in all his lungs that we may be able to experience and be able to do the things that we're able to do. And if we would grab a hold of that, if we would not grumble and dispute over the stupid things, because let's be honest, most of the time when we're grumbling and disputing, it's over the stupid things, right? But that we would, we would have the opportunity to do this with love and joy, that we would get the opportunity to do this. Why? So that we may shine among whom, among whom we would shine as lights in this world. 
We live in a dark world, friends, where a lot of the world is all about me, that I get what I get. I get what I want, and that's my pursuit in my life, is that I'm going to get that. And what, what, what the reality of it is, the, the, the path that we have been called upon, is that it's not about us. That all that we get to do, the breath that we breathe, the words that we speak, the actions that we take in our homes, in our communities, in our places of work, all of those things that we get to do is so that God may be, may be seen through our lives. That there's purpose to it. There's absolute purpose to this. And serving with purpose, with the purpose of building and strengthening the church, we have the opportunity to do that. I'm not talking about the organization of the church. I'm not so- talking about just calling people into the, into the ranks of the church and strengthening the organization of the church. I'm talking about the people of God. I'm talking about serving with the purpose of others seeing the goodness of who God is through our lives, strengthens and builds up the church. The whole church. Serving your family, serving your neighbors, serving your communities. There is people who are around you that need to experience Jesus. That they need to experience the goodness of God and that you are, may be that path to that. That this is what we get the opportunity to be a part of. They need to experience Jesus through you right where you are. Because let's be honest, not all of our circumstances are wonderful, are they? Some, some of you are working in places that you don't want to be working in. Some are, some are in households that you're like, I don't want to be in this household. There are things that, we are, that you are experiencing that makes it very difficult to shine like a light amongst those who live in a darkened world. But it's just submitting ourselves to him. And we get the opportunity to do that. We, no matter where you are, no matter where you are planted, you may grow. Because, why? Because that's God's will for your life. It's God's will for all of creation that there would be growth in their lives. No matter where they are no matter the circumstances, no matter the environment, but that we would have the opportunity to grow through serving right where we're planted. There's opportunities. Listen, we we have opportunities to to do that. There's opportunities all around you, but as an organization, as a a church body, we we are offering opportunities. We're setting up things that we're like, hey, let's, let's go serve our communities. There's great opportunities right here where we can go to our local laundromats and just care for people, pay for their laundry and love them so that they may see the goodness of God in a darkened world. The oil change, to serve at the oil changes, to serve women who have experienced loss, who don't have someone to support them, that we have an opportunity to love them right where they are and serve them right where they are. <laughs> that we may go into our communities during the parade season, and we can go show them who Jesus is by the joy that we have and that we show as we walk down those streets and generous with what we have. These are the opportunities that we have to find people at their lowest point who are experiencing a brokenness and a shame that they can't seem to break away from. We have an opportunity to serve right where we are planted to do that. This is what we get to do. And I don't know about you, but that's exciting. That God would do something so great in your life that you have an opportunity to tu- turn around and show others of how good he is. And it doesn't matter what you've experienced. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how many obstacles that you have been faced with or the oppression that maybe you have felt in your life. What the word tells us is that by steadfast love and faithfulness, Iniquity is atoned for. That regardless of what's been done to us, our steadfast love and faithfulness to Jesus, it's been atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. And when a man's ways please the Lord, listen, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. That means you're going to have enemies. But what it tells you is that you're pursuing and growing right where you're planted and growing in favor of God and with man. 
there will be peace even with your enemies because he is good and he is faithful and he wants great things for your life. So no matter what you've experienced in your life from mankind, God has better for you. It's our choice to pursue after that. Let's pray.